So in three, two. Good afternoon. I now call to order the March 30th, 2022 meeting of the Policy Review Committee of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. In accordance with Board Policy 8311, Hang on. The chair of a committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's policy review committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams Live on BCPS website. To conduct this meeting by virtual means, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting a discussion on an agenda item. Additionally, as a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Clark or Ms. Howie if you must leave the call by using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Ms. Clark, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Causey? Dr. Hager? Present. Ms. Hen? Present. Ms. Mack? Ms. Rowe? Present. Mr. Thomas? Here. You have a quorum, ma'am. Thank you. Ms. Clark, please call the roll of staff members participating in today's meeting. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Howie? Here. Dr. Zarchin? Present. Ms. Ferguson? Present. Ms. Lewis? Present. Did I fail to call any staff members? Thank you, ma'am. Okay, our first item is unfinished business policy requiring review because of MSCE guidelines. The um, first item is policy 5580, bullying, cyberbullying, harassment, and intimidation. Mr. Zarshan, please proceed. Thank you, and I will be introducing Ms. April Lewis, Executive Director for School Safety, to present on Policy 5580. Uh, Ms. Lewis. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you. I am back with the recommended changes for Policy 5580. I believe you have the document and the additions and changes to Policy 5580. Bullying, cyberbullying, harassment, or intimidation are highlighted for your consideration, and I will take any questions that you have at this time. Board members, are there any questions? Mr. Thomas. Thank you. I don't have a question. Um, I just wanted to state that I, I do like the definition that was provided for the perceived uh, power imbalance. I think that adds to the policy. Um, I know they bring a conversation about that last time, so I just wanted to say that I think it's I think it's really good. So thank you. Thank you. Board members, are there any other questions? Madam Chair, this is Ms. Causey. Go ahead. I just wanted to let you know that I've been in the meeting a few minutes. Okay. Did you have any questions on the bullying policy, cyberbullying, bullying and harassment intimidation? You're muted, Ms. Cosby. Thank you. I did have one question related to the policy, which is what is the um, feedback loop for the board to understand the uh, fidelity to implementation of the policy? I'm not sure I understand the question, ma'am. So there's um, a lot that's in the policy, and um, we had had the discussion about the distinction between policy and the implementing rule. And so <clears throat> I wanted to understand, and for the public to understand, what the feedback loop is for um, the board to understand the fidelity to implementation of the policy. We've heard a lot of concerns around um, discipline and bullying, and the policies um, have a lot of strength to them. And so a lot of what seems to be the case is it's a matter of implementation 
and whether there's communication to the public, um, how successfully the policies are being implemented or uh, where there's area for improvement. So again, I'm not completely sure I, I'm tracking with your question, uh, but the policy is sent to the State Department of Education as required uh, by the state superintendent. If the issue is whether or not there's a reporting mechanism for reporting back to the board, there is not an explicit one. It is implicit in the local school systems requirements to report to the state. But again, I'm I'm hesitant to speak more because I'm not sure that I understand exactly which question you're asking. So thank you for that. And in other policies um, in recent times, the Policy Review Committee and the board has included explicit reporting to the Board of Education. So um, I think it would be appropriate to add that to this policy if you're saying it's not explicit. So I'm just wondering if there's consensus around that with the committee or what other committee members thoughts are. So there is an implementation section that's section seven uh, that the board directs the superintendent to implement the policy if that's what you were asking. Yes, I thank you for that. Um, but as I said, there's other policies that have been strengthened over in recent months um, to include explicit reporting. So I'm curious if other board members feel that that would be, if there's consensus to add that. I don't want to take a lot of time with a motion if there's um, not general consensus. Um, so you're talking about adding to the reporting similar to how we have the superintendent report back to the board on other things. What are you looking for? The aggregate data of incidences? Well, I think it would be um, part of the administration for the superintendent or staff that he designates to design a reporting to the board that would show fidelity in implementing the policy or if there's areas for improvement in implementing the policy and what the impact is on our students and staff um, and whether it's it, it, it's <clears throat> correct implementation is assisting students um, to have a safe learning environment for them to achieve. So like an annual report? What's your, what would your motion be if you made a motion? For the superintendent to report annually to the board on the implementation of this policy. I, I have no problem with that being added to the policy. It's, it's part of other policies. Um, is there, is there general consensus around that, Mr. Thomas? Yeah, I just, I, 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 when, with that statement, I think it makes it makes it clear what the in, intent is. But I'm wondering, when we're asking the superintendent to implement the policy, I feel like the superintendent's rules, combined with any other presentations that the board requests, would satisfy the need for like a an annual report. Um, I don't know if like an annual report. What's to come of that annual report? Like, are we as the as the board? Like, are we going to look in this data and continue to review the policy? Because I think this is a policy. This policy we're reviewing now because we have to because of the new legislation. So I don't know what like what us getting the report would really do. What we would really do with that on the board of education. So I don't know if I support this. Uh, just because I think there are other ways for us to ask for this kind of data. Um, and maybe we could be more specific in like. What is it that we want? Do we want the data of incidents that are occurring instead of just like wanting to know how this policy is being implemented? I think the superintendent's rules do that. 
Well, that. Pro? I'm sorry. Go, Miss Hunter. You on? Did, I am. Okay, go ahead. Is that you? Can you hear me? Yeah. It is. Thank you. And I agree with Mr. Thomas that there are other ways to capture the data, and that was my line of thinking as well. However, um, I believe that this data, these data are extremely important to capture, and that by including it in the policy, we prioritize capturing it. And for that reason, I would support this motion to add it to the policy. And I think that doesn't preclude us from using the data or capturing it in such as asking our state for use in, in other evaluation um, methods. And so, in other words, to, to Mr. Thomas's point, we have other ways of capturing it. However, by including it in the policy, it assures that, as Ms. Causey said, that the superintendent does report back on the implementation of the policy to the board. I like that it's not specific because it's not our role to dictate the how. It's our job to say the what and that we do expect it to be reported out on. And it is up to the superintendent to determine um, what to do with that data to ensure fidelity with implementing the policy or our vision. So for that reason, I would support it. And I don't think we need to necessarily get into the discussion of the how at this point. So, so just our standard, our standard reporting <laughs> language that we have in other policies. Exactly. And I think on, yes, the okay. annual reporting back to the board. Thank you. I would, I would support that. Ms. Causey, if you want to make that motion. I move that we amend policy 5580 on page 7, line 30. Um, the board, excuse me, I'm going to just type it in the chat. Okay. So if you want to move on to other conversation while I do that. I did have one question if someone could answer that. Um, I have, I like the definition for perception of power, but one of the things that um, was sort of a mystery to the public that came out in conversations with the anti-bullying task force is that not every action that might be considered offensive is necessarily considering considered bullying and I've noticed that in the new policy the criteria for bullying is an imbalance of power and a demeaning action, et cetera, that is repeated. And so I guess my question is, if, if, a, if you were to have something going on between a couple of students that was harassment or would otherwise be considering harassing behavior, but there was no imbalance of power, would that be considered um, harassment under this policy because I know that when we report these incidents to the state, for instance, if a student walks up to another student and punches him in the face and it happens one time, it does not get reported in our data to the state under this policy as harassment because it's not repetitive. So supposing there's no perception of an imbalance of power, does that then mean that something that most people would consider just on its face bullying and harassment will then be not included in the data because there's no balance of power. I guess my thing is I feel like there are some ways in which this policy creates a lot of legal definitions for what is bullying and harassment in a way that could exclude certain behaviors that most people in their common understanding would consider bullying, harassment, or intimidation but that in our reporting procedures, we would not. So, you know, 
student A walks up to student B, punches him in the face and walks away. Parents fill out an anti-bullying and harassment form and find out, well, it wasn't bullying. Well, in their mind, they think it is. So I do have concerns about that because the, the definitions don't seem to resolve that issue. I can respond to that, Ms. Rowe. Thank you. And so there are separate definitions of bullying, harassment, and intimidation. So harassment can stand on its own, as can intimidation. The other thing to keep in mind is that if a behavior, as you described, someone walking up and attacking someone else, that is handled elsewhere in the discipline code. There's no magic bullet in attaching bullying to the title of it. We still have to respond regardless the classification of the inappropriate behavior. And so one of the things that we did recently, because there are letters that parents get that says whether or not it was founded or unfounded as bullying. But if we look at the situation and it is a different inappropriate behavior, then we do give a parent a letter that says your child may have been the target of inappropriate behavior and that behavior was handled according to the student code of conduct. So just because it's not bullying doesn't mean that it gets missed in staff's response to whatever that behavior is. So we're responding to behaviors whether or not they're classified as bullying, harassment, or intimidation. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, and so then how is that reflected in the aggregate data that's given to the state? So if they say there's X number of incidences of bullying mm -hmm. and X number were found to be not bullying is there a category where it says these were found not to be bullying but they were found to be some other thing that's negative no i, I don't think that's there it's either it was or was not bullying but okay. the state is not saying was it classified as something else so we're not going to the board and the public and the general assembly they're not going to see necessarily every single behaviorally negative incident that occurs in the school system, even though as a result of this aggregate reporting, even though parents may use this form to report? I think the answer to your question is yes. If there was a disciplinary consequence, for example, that resulted in a suspension, then it would show up there because what you described was an attack on a student. And so if there was a suspension that followed that, it would be captured in that data. But we are not giving data to the state that says we had a report of bullying, harassment or intimidation. It was actually a conflict or it was actually um, an attack on a student. That's not captured in the data that goes to MSDE with this particular report. So okay. I, I think I hear part of the question, Ms. Rowe, and please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, Ms. Lewis, if a parent um, files a bullying form and the incident is deemed not to have been bullying, would the filing of the form itself, not absent any uh, investigation into whether or not the underlying conduct was bullying, would the filing of the form itself be reported in the aggregate data or do yes. we not? We report every report that we get from parents. Okay, that so every, in that total number. So every form filed is a number in the data, and yes. then the number that are found to be bullying is a number in the data. Okay. And then that's it. Yes. Okay, so somebody would have to determine that we just don't know of all the things that were determined not to be bullying. There's just no information as to, is there any way that we report to the state or to MSDE every physical altercation that happens in a school building for any reason? So I'm going, I know Ms. Ferguson is on and Dr. Sarchin is on. That would not be reported. It's not reported under safety data that we are reporting. Not every physical altercation that occurs in a building. 
I mean, is could be there a way, mm -hmm. is that data collected? So good afternoon, this is Kim Ferguson. So we do collect suspension data and, sus and we do, we, we must um, report our suspension data to MSDE on an uh, annual basis. So what about physical altercations that do not result in a suspension? So if a physical altercation occurred in the building, I, I'm not sure why it wouldn't be, wouldn't result in a suspension, but I guess there are some cases where that would happen. Well, if we it, are, mm -hmm. for example, if it's deemed to be a result of a child's disability, that child would not be disciplined under the handbook if it's a manifestation of their disability, for instance. There are reasons. I guess I'm just wondering where is there is data collected on every physical altercation in a building, including the ones that don't result in suspension? So I'd have to look at, look into that a little further because, um, like I said before, we do collect data on suspensions. Um, certainly, there is a process to collect data related to manifestations, um, and certainly that information is included in that particular student's file. Um, but as far as us reporting data by student, certainly we don't do that at all. Yeah, no, I'm not suggesting that that we be given student um, personal information or anything. I'm just looking at like the aggregate data collection. Um, it, like, I guess if you had this aggregate data on physical altercations in schools, it would it would give people a, a way to be able to look at and attempt to deal with um, some of the violence or even perception of violence that may not exist in some schools, right? So if the incidents are tracked and those incidents, you could maybe there's a school that has a perception of violence, but if we track the incidents and you can say, well, actually this school doesn't have any more incidents than any other school then the tracking of the data and the data becomes the narrative as opposed to rumors and stories and other ways that narratives get formed about schools. And so I guess what I'm looking for is we're presenting this data to the state and we collect this data for the purpose of analyzing the situation to know what is actually occurring versus what the community thinks is occurring and at what point do we reconcile those things? Ms. Rowe, may I ask a related follow-up question? Yours? Uh, yes. So do we track referrals? Because wouldn't that capture the data that Ms. Rowe's referring to? Right, so and I was getting all, that. All physical, so all physical altercations would result in a referral and is referral data captured a central database that we can report on? So the question was, do we report it to MSDE? So we don't send referral data to MSDE. We send suspension data to MSDE. Do, okay. But do we capture? We do capture referral data, yes. So schools schools do, if they, enter, they can enter the referrals into the focus student information system and certainly can look at their referrals over time and how those referrals played out. So whether or not they ended up in a suspension or um, some other type of intervention. Okay. So we do have then on, it, it's fair to say, or it's a true statement that we, we can report out on the number of physical altercations by school. But once again, that is, so the data has to be entered into the system. And are we universally entering? That, data? That, that is the requirement. Thank you. Office referrals, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, that's the only question I had. Um, Ms. Kazi, did you put this in the chat? The, uh, the Thank you, Madam there? Chair. For some reason, after using Teams for three years, I am unable to access the chat, so I sent in an email. All right. And if anyone else can yeah. cut and paste that into the chat. Um, I move to amend policy 5580 on page seven, line 29, to include the sentence, the superintendent will report to the board on the implementation of this policy at least once a year. Is there a second? 
I'll second, second that. OK, Ms. Han will second it then. Um, I, I believe we've discussed this, but is there any further discussion necessary or can we just vote? Mr. Thomas? Thank you. Um, I, I just, again, I, I feel a little weird that we don't know the data that we're requesting when we when we talk about the implementation of this policy, but um, I, I think I'll support this in the way that it, I just see that it's written. Thank you. OK, Ms. Clark, would you call the vote, please? Yes, Ms. Causey. <clears throat> yes. Dr. Hager. Yes. Ms. Han. Yes. Ms. Rowe. Yes. Mr. Thomas. Yes. Thank you. And the motion carries. Are, are there any other motions on this policy? Hey, if there are no other uh, motions, yes. I don't have a motion, but I do have a questions that could prompt a motion. OK, go ahead. So the, my one question is about, so when we talk about um, the in school administrators investigation that was at, a, at the last board meeting mm -hmm. um, on page and the policy statement, uh, we don't, it's it's stated in policy statement and like Roman number, number one, but we don't actually like go into defining what the investigation looks like or what it is until Roman numeral number four standards. And is that OK that we that the we kind of go we don't really define it at the beginning and we, we then we like to go into it later? That that happens typically in policy because usually the rule will define who it, which it school administrator is supposed to conduct the investigation. And I believe the central office has practices on investigations. And if somebody were to disagree with an investigation, they could appeal it to the superintendent staff and then appeal it to the board and then go through that whole thing. So I don't know that we have to articulate in policy precisely what constitutes an investigation. Because I think that there's probably enough school handbooks, policies, rules, internal school system documents that articulate that. Ms. Howie, am I wrong on that? I think that's accurate, ma'am. OK. Thank you. And on line 37 of page two, um, it we when we're talking about bullying, so we define an imbalance of power in it says is unwanted demeaning behavior among students that involves a real or perceived power imbalance. And then when we talk about the behavior, it says it must be intentional and include an imbalance of power. We don't say it could include an, an a perceived imbalance of power. So I move to insert or perceived imbalance to line 37 after an imbalance on page two. Is there a second? So if you give me a moment, please, um, and Ms. Lewis as well, if you could check the model policy because if we are limiting in some way um, what is required by the model policy, I'd at least like to confirm that before the motion okay. is discussed further. So are you just adding to the language that's there? Yeah, instead of just an imbalance of power, just also put an, in, a, or perceived, an imbalance or perceived imbalance of power, just because we say that that's a part of bullying, but then when we say what it must include, we're saying it must include an, an imbalance of power. So I, I feel like. So you try to keep it consistent. Yeah. And the model policy says we may add to the language that is provided. So I think that is acceptable. OK. I'll second that motion, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Ms. Causey. Is, is there any um, debate on that motion? Hearing none, Ms. Clark, would you call the vote, please? Yes, Ms. Causey. Yes. Dr. Hager. Yes. Ms. Han. Yes. Ms. Rowe. Yes. Mr. Thomas. Yes. Motion carries. OK, are there any other questions or motions about this policy? OK. Um, all in favor of policy 5580 moving to first reader as presented 
as amended, please answer yes when your name is called. Those opposed, please answer no. If you are not ready to, to vote, answer pass, and you'll be called on again after the roll has been completely called. Ms. Clark, please call the roll. Um, Ms. Causey? Pass. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Ms. Max absent. Um, Mr. Thomas? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Okay, the motion carries. The next item is policy 80, 8230, orientation of new board members. Ms. Howie, please proceed. Thank you. Um, I'm just checking to make sure uh, that Ms. Ferguson and Ms. Lewis and Dr. Sarchin are no longer on the line and whether or not they can be excused. They may be excused. Thank you. Um, members of the committee, uh, you have before you suggested changes to policy 8230, which has been renamed as board member orientation. Uh, this policy is being presented to you based on recommendations from the Public Works Report. Uh, specifically, it was recommendation 1-10, a tier two recommendation. Um, there were also suggestions that the committee had uh, at a prior meeting, as well as one motion that was passed, uh, and that is reflected in what is highlighted in blue uh, concerning finalists for the, for the student member of the board to be included in any training materials. Um, in terms of other amendments, and um, I guess I would say this is this policy and the next two really do go to the heart of what you as the board do, your own business and your own operations. According to the Public Works report, uh, several board members felt that the orientation that um, they received was inadequate. So what we've tried to do to give you um, a foundation, if you will, to start your discussion and spark your discussion is to give you um, some additional information, both based on some of what um, the PRC members mentioned, as well as uh, some things in the public works report. So um, we've added um, under subsection two, um, pre-candidate board materials to include those individuals who are candidates for election as well as appointment to the board and to include as well that any orientation should describe the time commitments uh, that you all are fully aware that board member service requires. Additionally, we've included under subsection B, uh, 3B, what topics um, the board members would like to see in new board member orientation. So that would include um, the operating budget, the capital budget, uh, your calendar, your annual calendar, um, information on capital projects, uh, information orientation on the duties and responsibilities of board members. And uh, it was also suggested, again, based on the last discussion about this, um, this particular policy, uh, as well as in the public works report that it be clearly stated that um, the board will include funding for training in its annual budget. So with that, I'm, um, welcome, I welcome any questions you might have. But again, this is about how you want to operate and how you see orientation um, being handled, uh, what sorts of subjects you think need to be included or excluded. So uh, this is simply to get you started. Many members, are there questions? Mr. Thomas and then Ms. Cosby. 
Thank you. My question is just about the board's calendar. I think this was my suggestion at a, at a previous PRC meeting. When it says the board's calendar, that means like the calendar, the sequence of events that would happen throughout the year, like the, I'm just going to reference my term, my SMOB term, like the capital budget, count, voting on the school calendar, operating budget, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Correct. Ms. Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, based on some other uh, discussions in the Public Works recommendations and also um, discussions that the board has engaged in open session related to um, board council and supporting Senate Bill 55 uh, to clarify the board's authority to hire um, specific council. Um, I believe it would be appropriate to include board council in the um, paragraph where it states uh, the development of the orientation. <clears throat> so are you asking that board council um, assist in developing the orientation? Yes, and again, you know, I can make a motion or board members could just uh, let me know if there's consensus. I do agree with that. Other board members, is there consensus on that idea of including um, board council in the development of orientation? Mr. Thomas? I, I Yeah, I think I agree with that, but if would it be development or would it be like development or, and review? Because I think, you know, these orientation materials, if they're developed with these new information for next year, then they wouldn't consistently be redeveloped. So I don't know, I think maybe like developed well, and reviewed. It could be if there's laws changed or whatever. There could be things that need to be in an orientation this time that, I mean, Ms. Howie, when we had our orientation, we had reviews of certain state board opinions and different things or changes to laws. So if you had a board orientation mm -hmm. and you don't necessarily always have members coming all in at the same time either, so you, you could conceivably have an orientation where if you have a vacancy and someone gets appointed late, that orientation may not be exactly the same as previous orientation of other members. So, and given that the board's attorney represents the board, the board's attorney may have perspective on orientation concerning the appeals that we hear and things like that, that might So in past better. years, uh, you have had board council present? Uh, and I'm just blanking on whether or not uh, it was superintendent who invited board council or whether or not uh, it was the board president slash chair at the time. I'm just not recalling, but I do recall specific orientation materials prepared by prior outside council or prior board council just on the appeals process. Um, that was and that was distributed and has been distributed. And I believe it's part of the board's orientation packet, or it was in past years at least. So there has been involvement before, um, again, both direct and indirect. And I'm just not remembering who invited uh, board council to prior orientation sessions. So Ms. Kazi, are you suggesting a motion that would just as a matter of course, include the board council. Is that the result you're looking for? Yes, and also I was looking through the policy draft again, and it doesn't, I, and I can't find it, and maybe um, Ms. Howie can point it out, where it states who develops and um, provides the training. It doesn't. In past years, um, as you know, there have been several individuals involved, including your um, executive, your senior administrative assistant. I've been involved in past years. Um, prior board council has been involved in past years. Uh, other staff members have been involved, but it does not. The public works recommendation, however, did indicate that the superintendent should um, develop the training as well as uh, school system legal counsel. Well, and it makes sense because um, it, as was the case with the last election and the um, 
appointment cycle, there were eight new members um, mm -hmm. and the, neither the chair nor the vice chair that were before the elections came back after the elections. So, you know, there really <clears throat> was a, a vacuum there. And also given the fact that the superintendent administers the staff that, you know, can um, pull together documents and do the printing and, um, you know, analyze all of the construction projects and so forth. Um, that makes a lot of sense. Well, the superintendent is also the secretary treasurer of the board. So this, the the superintendent is has a, a unique officer role that doesn't simply disappear with an election or an appointment. So Ms. Rowe? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so Go I, ahead, I, would I would support the involvement of board council. I don't know that it's appropriate for board council to develop the training. However, I believe part of the orientation should be facilitated by board council, which I suppose would, would then be deve also developed by board council pertaining to the legal um, responsibilities, um, perhaps governance, perhaps parliamentary procedure, um, those aspects that are pertinent to board council um, should should be should fall to board council um, okay. to play a pivotal role in that. But I, I don't um, feel and wouldn't support board council developing all of it as, as we're so, discussing right now. I so think the superintendent someone, art school system council may play a play a role, but I would support including board council for the development of the content that pertains specifically to um, legal responsibilities of the board, perhaps parliamentary procedure and and those aspects. Does someone have a motion for language that would accomplish that? Or would staff like to go back and include board council in this document somewhere? So I, I, I see I, Dr. Hager has um, placed a comment in the chat. Uh, thank you. I just oh, was wondering. Um, I just I was one clarification and some of it we've already discussed, but um, number three B three says mm -hmm. inviting each new member to meet with the superintendent would um, would language that suggests uh, inviting each new mem member to meet with the superintendent and board council be sufficient for this discussion, do you think? So in past years, um, and again, this is this is how you envision uh, best practices in your training, but in past years, the inviting each new member, my understanding is that there was a separate meeting. There was okay. a one-on-one -on -one meeting between the superintendent and the new board member. Okay, I see what you mean. So that wouldn't that wouldn't mean fit there. I was just trying to figure out a way to put what we're discussing in the policy. Thank you. So maybe under convening a meeting for the primary purpose of oriented new members to his or her responsibilities, policy making administration, legal and fiscal, and um, that convening a meeting, maybe we need something in this policy to articulate an expectation that board council should be included in that meeting. As a separate, would suggest a separate meeting? No, know? so B1, has the orientation is convening a meeting for the primary purpose of or purpose of orienting new members to his her responsibilities and then it goes on to itemize those mm -hmm. um, if we have language that states this meeting should include board council right off the end of that That would mean that the orientation meeting that the board members have together, board council would be present and presumably able to answer questions, interject, etc. Is there consensus around that language? Can you repeat the language? So B1, it mm -hmm. says um, convening a meeting for the purpose of orienting new members to his or her responsibilities, policy making and administration, legal and fiscal responsibilities, 
opening meeting laws, board structure and organization, and the mission and goals of BCPS. This meeting will include board council. Okay, and should we also specify who else is supposed to be there? No, because I think that the superintendent can figure that out as the secretary treasurer of the board when he is establishing the meeting who else needs to be there because obviously whoever participates in forming the orientation materials would have to be there so anyone else who's going to be there is going to be school system staff so the superintendent can figure that out the board attorney is not school system staff so if the policy specifies that the board attorney is to be present I think that's sufficient. Does anyone disagree? Hearing none, um, Ms. Howie, will you please incorporate that language as an amendment? Um, yes. are, there, are there any other questions or suggested amendments about this policy? Ms. Causey? Um, I just had a question. Should it include language that this uh, meeting is an administrative meeting, so it's not open to the public um, because I think if people, the public especially reads um, the policy and it says convening a meeting, um, they may have an expectation that it's open, but it oh. is an administrative meeting where no decisions are being made about policy, no actions being taken. Um, so I think that that would be helpful for the public, but also uh, future board members to understand. So insert the word administrative after convening a, a so it reads convening an administrative meeting. So I would recommend complete convening an administrative function meeting because that is the that's the legal term thing. used in the Open Meetings Act. That sounds good to me. Does anyone disagree? Hearing none, Ms. Howie, will you please incorporate that language as an amendment? Yes, ma'am. Mr. Thomas? Yeah, I just, again, I'm going back to, should we, because we don't say anywhere, we say an implementation, we say the board shall implement this policy. We don't say that the superintendent shall implement the policy. Um, we say, all we say is that he will, the superintendent will schedule a meeting. So could we also add, um, and again, this might be redundant as, you, as before, but this meeting should include board council and so, Mr. Thomas, just just uh, and I'm not sure where you're going to end up, but I just want to make sure you start in the right place. Um, this policy is in the 8000 series, which is your internal, the board's internal policies. So it's almost like board procedures. So superintendent doesn't implement the board's procedures about itself. It's the board that does that. There may be certain responsibilities that are given to the superintendent um, but that is as far as implementation it's the board that implements its own policies about its own um, its own procedures your internal operating procedures so again not i'm not sure if you're if that was is that if that's going to take you in another direction so it wouldn't be um, appropriate and we don't in other 8000 series policies um, indicate that the superintendent should implement because the superintendent superintendent doesn't direct the board yeah i think mr part. thomas what's confusing is that it's always helpful to remember that the superintendent is also a part of the board and mm -hmm. is the secretary treasurer of the board and therefore um when the superintendent does something in regard to one of the board's internal policies even though it says superintendent it could just as easily say the secretary treasurer of the board right so the superintendent operates sometimes as a part of the board and sometimes independent from the board as the superintendent and so it can be confusing to know which is happening at which times. Ms. Causey. Thank you, Madam uh, Chair. So um, I have my question is about implementation in line with Mr. Thomas, because um, with implementation, I can tell you over the years, there has been questions about um, 
how uh, board policies get implemented and it's suggested in public um, works that there is clarity that's provided as well as um, operating manuals and so forth. So whereas the policies that state clearly the board directs superintendent to implement this policy, then there's associated rules. But what one can note is that for the 8000 series, there's very few, um, if any, rules. And, and that's where there can be questions or um, just a lack of clarity, um, especially in times of transition. So I would support uh, some additional language. Um, the board will implement this policy with the uh, assistance of, you know, if you want to say the Treasury Secretary of the board or the superintendent to, to be clear, <clears throat> because again, uh, currently the board only has <clears throat> reporting to it, the Office of Internal Audit, um, staff and if the this this whole activity is based on transition in board members which um, with elections could be a large number and again so who from the board is driving um, the implementation it so does I, say, it does say the superintendent in the policy there is a where was it as soon as practical upon appointment and or election to the board, the superintendent shall schedule an orientation session to acquaint new board members to the operations of the board of Baltimore County Public Schools. And then the rest of that articulates what that is. So the policy itself does put that part of the orientation on the superintendent. I assume as the secretary treasurer of the board. <clears throat> then I think it would be helpful to have that language cl clarified in the implementation statement. And I would welcome a suggestion as to so, that, from Ms. Howie or. I see Mr. Thomas is typing, so I don't want to. So what, like, how would we do that? This, the superintendent in his capacity as secretary treasurer of the board shall implement this policy. <clears throat> this how um, we give a suggestion. I'm not sure I understand the problem that is being discussed um, or the problem that's been, the perception of a problem has been identified. So. Let me speak by example. Uh, the uh, Prince George's County um, school system, for example, uh, has a 9000 series and their 9000 series is almost like our 8000 series. It is the um, internal, I believe it's called internal board procedures, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so it, it's, it's clear that, again, this is what the board is doing about itself. And Ms. Causey, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think, and again, please correct me, I think what you're trying to determine is whether or not this is actually going to happen and whether or not this function is actually going to go forward. And as Ms. Rowe pointed out, um, the superintendent is the one who has to schedule it. And and it's it's mandatory. So if the superintendent doesn't schedule it, the superintendent hasn't complied with the policy. And again, I'm not sure if that's what you're you're getting to. Um, thank you for that information. Um, I was just typing in the chat that um, Excuse me, at my. Um, <clears throat> thank you um, for that information. I would just to clarify my position, I would move to amend policy 8230 by adding language on page two, line 30, with the support of the superintendent, board council, and law office staff. Second, Thomas. So I don't think I need to speak to my motion because okay. we've, we've discussed it. Ms. Hen, do you have any comments or Ms. Hager? Hi, thank you, Ms. Rowe. I was just going to offer um, 
a similar motion and on page two, line 36, and both of these actually may apply, um, in which case I would offer an amendment to Ms. Pauzy's motion. To so that I, and to on line 36. So that's, um, excuse me, ma'am, That's that sounds like a different motion. Uh, if you want to move to amend the amendment, then you have to either strike out, strike out and insert, um, or add to Ms. Causey's motion. It's what you're suggesting by putting it in a new line is is um, another um, amendment. So I just want to understand. Ms. Hagger, uh, we can hear that after we process this one. Ms. Hager, did you have okay. Dr. Hager? May I speak to that, Ms. Rowe? Before well, I because I think it affects what Ms. Causey's motion does, because I don't know that I would support her motion independently. Okay, just yes, go ahead. So, um, which is why I wanted to amend it to add a change on line 36, which is that the board shall, or that the board authorizes the superintendent to implement this policy. Oh, the board authorizes the superintendent as opposed to shall implement this policy. So, and that would be an entirely new motion. Um, How, um, Ms. Howard? Because you're not changing the language that Ms. Causey has recommended. And Ms. Causey, I'm assuming now that you mean line 36 and not line 30. Thank you for catching my typo. That's quite all right. I was trying to figure out how it, that worked. So, you, Allie, I was looking for that myself. So, it would be the the board shall implement this policy with the support of the superintendent, board council, and law office staff. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that I see a qualitative difference between Ms. Causey's motion and the board authorizes the superintendent to implement this policy, which is the motion Ms. Hen is thinking would be better. May I speak to that, Ms. Rowe? Uh, I think we do need to understand the difference. Yes, I, may I speak to the difference? Yes, go ahead. So going back to our role of governance being the what and the superintendent being the how, I believe that the policy is very specific as written and that the superintendent will pull in the resources that he requires, whether it be board council, law office staff, um, board administrative support staff or additional staff. And I would not want to limit um, it in policy which support resources um, are required to implement the policy. So I would support a more generic um, statement such as the one I propose that the board authorizes the superintendent to implement this policy and allow him to pull in any support resources required. I see. Does the committee have any discussion on the subject? Because if we like Ms. Hatton's idea better, then we should vote this one, this motion down. So Ms. Hatton, yes, excuse me, Ms. Rowe. Um, I would just say that my motion um, with the support of the superintendent, board council and law office does not prevent the superintendent through his support to bring in anyone he thinks. But I wanted to specify that board counsel would be a support available and uh, law office staff, since law office staff was um, identified, <clears throat> excuse me, um, earlier as a, um, as a part of this orientation. Okay. Um, Mr. Thomas, you had a comment? Yes, no? I, just that I support this motion. I, okay. I support Ms. Thank you. Dr. Hager, did you have a comment? Yeah, I think it was me. I just, um, I like Ms. Causey's language personally. I think it's um, broad enough and um, inclusive enough. And I, I think that that would be my preferred language of the two that we're discussing. Yes, I think I agree. Um, Ms. Clark, would you call the vote, please? Yes. 
Yes, Ms. Kalazi. Yes. <clears throat> Dr. Hager. Yes. Ms. Han. Yes. Ms. Max absent. Ms. Uh, Mr. Thomas. Yes. Ms. Rowe. Yes. Five in favor. Are there any more amendments or changes or questions about this policy? Hang on, let's let Ms. Hen go first. Ms. Hen, did you still want to make any amendment? No, thanks. No, thank you. Okay, Mr. Thomas? Yeah, just uh, I, I still feel uncomfortable with the fact that in the policy, since there's no rules attached to this, um, I like that, the, that we just added this at the end, but that when we say um, this should include board counsel, that we don't also say this should also include staff designated by the superintendent. Um, it's just the superintendent. It's just I would think I, it says the superintendent, but I would think that the superintendent has the authority to utilize his staff in any way he sees fit. I mean, he can bring whatever staff he wants. I don't think we're limiting the superintendent in any way. Ms. Howie, would that be your legal interpretation of the policy? Yes, ma'am. If the superintendent needs, for example, um, you have a requirement of training each board member with online access to, um, to board docs, systems and networks, um, I would not be the person. So the right. superintendent is the one who would bring in the necessary personnel to train depending on what the um, the particular content is. Yes. So computer people, in other words. OK, I, I still feel strongly that the language should be included, so I'm going to move to insert and other staff designated by the superintendent after the added this meeting, this meeting this meeting should include board council language on page two, line 10. Wait, um, we have board council. I'm sorry, where are you trying to add that? Yeah, so basically it would read convening a meeting for the primary purpose, blah, 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 blah. This meeting should include board council and other staff designated by the superintendent. So you're adding and other staff designated by the superintendent. Um, members of the committee be reminded that you've already added to um, that particular section. This meeting should include board council. That right. amendment has already passed. Right, so then I believe Mr. Thomas wants us to add after include board council and any other staff designated by the superintendent. Yes. Does anyone on the committee object to that language? No. OK, hearing none, Ms. Howie, will you please um, change that language as an amendment? Surely. Are there any other amendments to this policy? OK, hearing none, Ms. Clark, will you please um, call the vote to forward policy 8230 to first reader? Yes, Ms. Causey. Yes. Dr. Hager. Yes. Ms. Han. Yes. Ms. Mack, absent. Mr. Thomas. Yes. Ms. Rowe. Yes. Thank you. Okay, policy 8230 is moved to first reader. Ms. Howie, um, what time does this meeting end again? Uh, we're scheduled to go until six. Until six, okay, because yes. I saw that our Board doc says up to 545. Um, so we have two more policies to get through board members. I just wanted to bring that to your attention as we're moving through time so you realize where we are with our time. Policy um, 5500. 8500 actually. No. 8500, I'm sorry. That's all right. So um, this policy is board self-evaluation. Um, I'm not sure looking at the time that a half hour would be sufficient because again, this is um, for lack of a better term, um, how the board is navel gazing. How do you decide as the board whether or not you're doing um, in an effective way your jobs? So what is it? What components do you want to evaluate yourselves? Um, I've taken the liberty of adding a timeline uh, in the policy, that timeline has been adjusted based on Mr. Thomas's comments that the student board member should be more involved. So we have adjusted the timeline. Um, this is partially in, um, in 
response to Public Works Recommendation 112, which is a tier one recommendation. And the recommendation was that the board update its self-assessment instrument, but also um, that the board conduct its uh, self-assessment annually. Um, this policy has already been on the books about your annual evaluation. Again, this is to give you the idea, the springboard from which to have the discussion about how you want to evaluate yourselves, when you want to evaluate yourselves. Um, this is your hard work, as it were. Um, what are the sorts of areas in which you want to conduct your evaluation? Um, what exactly is it that you will consider to be success? Or what areas are relevant to you to consider your success as um, the operating and policy making body of the, the school system? So with that, um, again, it's to that extent, it's a uh, it isn't necessarily a blank slate, but it is a it. I find it easier to edit when someone else sends me something. I'm hoping that the board will find it easier to start the discussion based on some of what was pulled from public works, some of what you've already said, um, and that is reflected uh, hopefully in what is in the draft 8500. So Ms. Howie, um, before I ask other board members, was any of this draft taken from recommendations of MABE about how boards should do self-evaluations? It was not. Okay, board member or committee members, are there any questions? Mr. Thomas? Thank you. I um, I think we should also include under the list, I think what's, what's written out is incredible um, in, terms of, in terms of how we should evaluate ourselves. But I think another thing that we should put is committee productivity maybe, or uh, something related to board committees because we have what seven standing committees and I think we should also include those in our evaluation of the committees that we serve on what we think of what we were able to accomplish in the committees how we can be more productive in the committees going into the future um so I, I just want to throw that out there to see if any other board members uh, agree that that should be something that we we accept ourselves with so are you suggesting so does this policy um outline the instrument of a self assessment? No, ma'am, it does not. Okay, it so simply that's... says the elements of the self assessment, uh, but the specific tool is not outlined in the policy. The board may want to change tools from year to year. Uh, so I would be hesitant to add a specific tool. Again, it's the board's policy, and this is how you see whether or not um, you're doing what you say you uh, want to do or accomplishing what you believe should be accomplished. So this really is about, I mean, I, I'll say it as the kids do, kids do, it's really all about you. I think a lot of what the committee work does is sort of encapsulated in a lot of those 11 itemized categories. So each committee has different functions and they do sort of fall out in there if you really look at it. OK, but maybe leave that to the instrument is what I'm suggesting, Mr. Thomas, because the board could seek Mabe's help in facilitating mm -hmm. the development of an instrument in the same way that we um, facilitated the development of our civility code. And I think that rather than Rather than having the policy be too detailed, this might be a very good situation for allowing the policy to be a little intentionally um, vague. Um, what I would support, though, is language that that says the board shall implement this policy. I don't know, or a suggestion. We, there was another policy we just did that had the suggestion of including MABE or attending MABE training. I think language suggesting that MABE be utilized in the development of the assessment tool or to facilitate the development of assessment tool would be good. So you did have in the board member orientation reference to uh, NSBA and MABE with respect to orientation, but just point out it doesn't right. speak to Mabe's involvement otherwise. Um, so uh, that is 
Again, does, your policy. MAID does have the ability to facilitate board self-assessment tools and to facilitate whole board assessments, self-assessments. So, yes. um, so I see you have questions from question members is, of the committee. Yeah, um, Ms. Kazi. Thank you. So um, I had questions related to the time frame and also um, in Public Works. Uh, they suggested that the board council tally the results of the. Um, evaluations, the, the board and I believe the superintendent's evaluations. That's so I correct. thought that that should be clarified because that is a difference. Um, from past practice. So mm -hmm. two things. One, identifying the board council who will um, collect and compile the board self evaluations and the board's superintendent evaluations, um, which is maybe in a different a different place, <clears throat> but just to have that conversation here. And then the other issue is the timeline seems very compressed for a time frame when um, historically we only have one meeting in July and June. Um, you know, there's graduations as well as meetings, so I just wanted to start that conversation. And again, that's the purpose of the policy for you to discuss what works for you. I do also want to say that I support um, the changing the time frame to include the student member of the board because um, it's a very important voice and uh, by statute they aren't able to be engaged unless they are the member so if they've been replaced by another student they they are precluded so i do support trying to change the time frame to support um, um, the student member of the board's inclusion Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Hager. Um, thank you. I just want to say that I, I think that the changes were really good and I looked at the other other model policies and the analysis and it seems that few districts have uh, as detailed of a policy as this. It looked like it's similar to only one other district. So um, I, I think that these are, are positive changes in general. Um, I do agree with Mr. Thomas about adding something about committees in the areas um, of evaluation. I think that's a good idea. And as far as the timeline goes, um, I think May and June both seem like reasonable dates. Um, the third date of when we would create and publish for the public a plan to address the deficiencies. I think that is where we would need to spend a little bit more time. I don't know if September would be a reasonable um, date that would give us a few months, but I, you know, with summer vacations and and um, a kind of a thinner schedule in the summer, um, that's something I think that needs to have a lot of thought put into it. And so um, that would be the only the only two changes that that I would um, personally initially think should be added. So my only question back to the board again, in thinking about your own work, if you um, publish your report for the public in September, is that going to give you sufficient time if by May you're again doing another evaluation? So just making sure that you have sufficient time to do the work you need to do. Uh, and it may be that September is more, rash, more um, reasonable because you're into the school year. As you said, you've passed the summer, uh, but you're only that's cutting off the the months on the back end for doing the evaluative work. So that would be my only question. I think it's difficult to say what month would best include the student member because any student member we have only sits for a year. And if we do this annually, any time in the year, every student part, every student member will participate at least once. So I think the question is, when is it? When is the efficacy of the evaluative instrument going to be the best to have people's um, 
you know, the point of this is that you see what you're doing well, you see what you're not doing well, and you make changes as an individual and as a board to how we're doing things. So the question is, at what point in the year is the best place to think about that? And I would have the tendency to think for myself personally, the best place to do that is January. Because you're coming back from Christmas break or from winter break and you've had the first part of the school year. And now you're looking at the second half of the school year. And it just might be a good time to take stock of and it's enough time that the student members been serving for a while but still has some time left. Are there thoughts on that? Uh, Mr. Thomas and then Ms. Causey. Thank you. I think when our school system is really doing a lot of this reevaluation overall, um, you know, that's kind of coming towards the end of the school year. So I personally you know, like the summer months better because the sp late sp early spring or late spring or early, early summer months better just because it kind of matches with the school year. And I think that January is going to be a very big, big time January, February, March with the budget, the operating budget. So that might be very hard to manage. Um, but I, I, so I, I personally think the later months are better in the school year. Ms. Causey. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Um, I was going to make a suggestion that um, in the timeline that um, we add that it would be discussed at administrative function at the board retreat in July um, for publishing a public report in August. Um, but um, I'm also, you know, mindful of the conversation. Um, and then in reviewing the timeline, I think <clears throat> if we're going to do an L a, a, a self evaluation in June, that that assessment uh, metric, the metrics included, should have already been designed. So, like, we should, um, you know, we should have that um, instrument designed a year in advance so that we know what we're measuring ahead of time. Okay. So, um, and Ms. Rowe, for January, uh, for the boards, for the committee's consideration, particularly this year, in an election year, um, the new board is seated in December. Right, so then you have one month and then you're doing sure. I don't have a strong opinion either way. Mm -hmm. um, I did want to offer um, an amendment though that we put language so after C there would be a D and it would be the board may request that may facilitate the development of a board self-assessment tool. Um, are there any objections to that language? Do you mean facilitate their creation or facilitate the? The board may request that may facilitate the development of a board self-assessment tool. I agree with that. Uh, Ms. Mr. Rowe? Thomas. Yes. Uh, so with this board assessment tool, it's going to be taking in the factors that we list that above. So should we stay with the factors? I don't think we have to state what the what the assessment tool includes beyond what the policy already states because May really has this down to a science. And in the same way they facilitated our civility agreement, they have this board self-assessment tool stuff really worked out down to a science about what boards all over the state do and SBA helps with what boards all over the country do. I think if we just put that language in the policy that it will also speed up the process of developing the assessment tool and the assessment tool can be changed annually. So I don't know if I want to start dictating to other future boards like if we leave it at that, then what it means is that that tool, the development of that tool is its own process. Right, but I the board may request MAPE to help. 
I worry that if maybe to create the, the this tool, this course assessment tool, it might not include all of the factors that we listed those eleven things. It doesn't say Mabe creates it. It says Mabe facilitates the development, which means Mabe comes to the board, just like Mabe facilitated the development of our civility code. They didn't create it. We did, but they facilitated the creation of the civility code. Do you see the difference? Just like the board chair facilitates a meeting. So it would essentially be similar to the way we have our board retreats and our board trainings from Mabe. Mabe would come in and get the board together and facilitate through conversation and, and board work what the board self evaluation should be and what it should include. And they would likely bring all of their best practices, knowledge, and some templates and some other things. And then those board members would determine what goes in the board self evaluation. And then that would become this assessment tool. That's why I, I use the word facilitate. I understand, but I, I worry that, for example, if they were to create a template, then the template might not include room for all of these things to be discussed that the board be self evaluating itself on. Um, so if that was just policy, it has to. Then I think we should, okay. I, I was going to say, I think it should say like in compliance with this policy at the end of, of that. Oh, okay. So um, so, uh, we have to be compliant with our policies regardless. So perhaps, and uh, again, tell me um, if this is going to be helpful. Um, if the committee does not believe that you'll be taking final action on this policy tonight, um, what uh, staff can do is follow up with uh, either Ms. Young, Ms. Glendening um, about the process they've used in other um, local school systems with respect to facilitating self assessments just so you know what the process is because this policy is about your process and you have to be comfortable with it uh, because of so uh, because of the fact so much of it is new and I'm sensing some some questions that uh, even though they're not directly related to the language that will be placed in policy may help the committee in shaping whether or not it wants to add, subtract, or divide parts of the policy. So Ms. Howie, are you suggesting that staff take this back and do some more research with NAEP's facilitation capacity? I can if you believe that would help. If the board, if the committee believes that you have all you need in order to move the, the policy forward, that's, I mean, that's fine. Um, I'm just sensing that there are questions about what process would be used. Um, so I think it's, I think it's up to the committee. Um, I'm not sure the committee wants to keep this schedule. I don't think that's, I think you've discussed it, but I don't think I've heard um, whether or not uh, this schedule is acceptable to the committee. Um, I have heard that you believe that, uh, at least it sounds as if most of the bo board believes that the 11 um, areas that are identified in subsection 2B are acceptable, but Mr. Thomas did ask about committee meetings. Ms. Rose said she believed that committees were um, embedded because all the actions and functions of committees are part of the 11 areas. Um, so, uh, Well, and that it could be part of the instrument. Yes. That further committee, that could be part of the answer. Mr. Thomas, you're muted. You can unmute and speak. Yeah, I just, but again, I don't feel like we're specifying that we want committee things to be in the instrument that we're using, that we want the MABE tool, the instrument that MABE might help facilitate, like, that we, that we want that to include these 11 policies. That That's kind of what I'm trying to articulate, is I think that if we're going to add that, we need to state exactly that these are the things we, we want to be involved in that tool. So that's why I wanted to put so, this. Uh, well, so I don't I, think that, and I'm going from many years ago when I worked at MABE, uh, MABE did not impose uh, particular standards on local school boards. So uh, MABE isn't going to, you know, bogart its way in and say you must um, use these particular, this particular instrument in this particular way ignoring uh, board policy or local board's policy. I That's not the way they operate. So I don't think they've changed that much since, you know, the dark ages when I was there. I do like Ms. Howie's idea of taking this back to MABE staff and getting more information. And if 
we could continue this policy in another meeting with more information if no if the committee does not object to that and then we have exactly five minutes to do the last policy on our agenda does anyone in the committee object to taking this policy up at a later meeting after staff have had more conversations with Mabe about what assistance they can give us with facilitation, et cetera. So Ms. Rowe, I just um, asked, yeah. did um, I, I had a question or comment, oh, which I'm is sorry. did was your motion seconded and does do we need to process that? Oh, the the motion, one, way? it's it's been discussed at length, so, right. so that essentially kind of, you've seconded it by discussing it. So does anyone uh, object to the language the board may request that may facilitate the development of a board self-assessment tool. Mr. Um, Thomas. Are yeah. we, I, I do, because I think we need to state that somewhere in there that it, it is in compliance with. So the can we it. postpone that motion sure. until we bring back the policy? Ms. Howie, if you would make a note of that postponed motion, I would appreciate it. And this is Aaron. Um, would that would we have to pay Mabe for that service? Is my only concern with that addition. Um, I think that's information we should also obtain. Yeah. Thank you. But I think those questions is partly to why I suggested that the language would be the board may and not the board shall, because Mabe could change pricing or impose pricing or whatever, and then the board might make a decision not to. Yes, that's why I like that language. So I all right, let's so let's postpone. Let's um let's move on to our next policy. We will take this one back up again in another committee meeting. Mm -hmm. And that policy is my screen went blank. Is 8501 superintendent evaluation. Go ahead, Ms. Howie. Thank you, members of the committee. I'm bringing back to you um, policy 8501, superintendent evaluation. Uh, there was um, in the uh, public works report a finding, it's find recommendation 111, that the board refines the superintendent's evaluation instrument to include uh, some key metrics. So the policy is being brought back to you um, based on comments, prior comments, from the committee, um, what staff is recommending in the uh, draft that is before you? Is it the evaluative process that is set out in subsection two? Uh, is basically what mirrors or does mirror what is in the superintendent's employment contract about the superintendent's evaluation? Okay, we have exactly two minutes I feel that probably this needs more than two minutes. I agree with you. Um, does the committee feel that this needs more than two minutes? Yes, I did have a quick comment that will um, help okay. guide the conclusion. Uh, Thank you. Um, the board has um, uh, ad hoc superintendent evaluation committee um, that I think should um, well, that is working on this, should be involved in working on this, and I'll um, defer any further comments to Ms. Hen, who has said she has a comment. Ms. Hen? Um, Mr. Thomas, and I believe Dr. Hager had comments in the chat before me, but oh, I would recommend deferring discussion since we have two minutes. Hey, I do think that we do need to defer discussion on this policy. Dr. Hager, no comment? Okay. Um, let's, let's defer discussion on this because Christian, did you have a comment? You didn't put it in the chat, so I didn't. I, clear did, your I think Thomas put a motion in the chat, which, but yeah. we don't I'm have sorry. Time. I just, oh, I see. Let's yeah. take this policy up at a at another meeting because. So, how many policies did we process this meeting, Miss Holly? Um, two. <laughs> yes, ma'am. That would be two. So you um. You've done more than half of your work, actually, because we um, you did give direction on the other two, so you've done all of okay, your work. So we've done all of our work. So let's, let's move the goalposts just a little bit. Move the goalposts. to make sure that the the committee is aware that 
we are going to be taking 5580, which is this bullying, cyberbullying policy forward. Um, I believe it's at the next meeting uh, so that it can be passed prior to um, May, the end of May, which is when the, the state requires a report from the LEAs. So just want you to know you'll see it sooner than you would normally see it. Okay. Sooner again, I should say. Let me. I've gotten lost in my script here. Let me find the end here. All right, so. Announcements and adjournment. The next meeting of the policy review committee is scheduled for May 9th, 2022 at 430 PM. Because there's no further business, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, committee members. Enjoy your evening. Thank you. Good night.